In this episode of Investors and Operators, I sit down with Mark Cabrera, Managing Director and Co-Head of Healthcare at Oppenheimer's Investment Banking Group. Uh, Mark, today we're going to dive deep into some really cool parts of your story that you've shared with me. And before we do that, though, can you just kind of share just maybe 30, 60 seconds on uh, Oppenheimer Healthcare and kind of the facts and figures and what people need to know? Thanks, Jordan. First of all, this is great. I, uh, I'm really excited about sitting down with you today. So Oppenheimer Healthcare, uh, I focus on services. Uh, our business is really a private company sales business. And so we average uh, anywhere from eight to 12 uh, private company sales a year. Uh, they, they, those companies range in size from you know, five to 10 million of EBITDA on the low end to north of 50 million on the high end. Uh, we're fairly narrowly focused in terms of sectors. Uh, so physician services, uh, value-based uh, models, uh, managed care, uh, let's see, home health or services in the home, uh, behavioral health. So that's a, that's a wide uh, section of the healthcare pie. Um, but we found that there's so much going on in, just in those few subsectors that um, it's kept us very busy. And uh, probably the most important stat that I'm proud of is uh, we, we did this math recently. Uh, 92% of our clients that have engaged us close their deal. Uh, so we think that's an industry leading metric and it's one we're, we're really proud of. All right, Mark, one of the questions I love to ask people is what was your first job? My first job, uh, 14 years old, picking tobacco uh, in a Connecticut farm. And uh, what I still remember today, Jordan, is every day going home and having to wash my hands for 15 minutes to get the tar off of them. <laughs> Wait, how much did you earn that summer? The whole summer, I, uh, $250. And, and I actually know that because it's, it's on my social security <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, earning tracker. Was that was that legal at the time? It was. Uh, yes, it was legal. Uh, Fourteen years old, uh, you are eligible to get agricultural minimum wage, and that's uh, you know that's what was available. Uh, the paper route in my neighborhood was already taken. Hmm. Okay, what did you do with the two hundred fifty? I bought a shiny blue Peugeot ten speed bicycle. And uh, I think at the time it cost. Do you, have a picture, do you have a picture of that? I don't have a picture of it. Uh, I I uh, I bet you, you you can buy them now on eBay for a <laughs> thousand. <laughs> I think at the time it was two hundred and eighty dollars, and I had to beg and plead with my parents to kick in thirty bucks. <laughs> uh, so. But I will tell you, I rode that bike for years. That's awesome. Um... Okay, so let's bridge the gap between 14 years old and picking tobacco and having tar in your hands and getting that $250 to buy a bike, a 10 speed bike, to now you've been doing investment banking for 20 years and specifically within healthcare. Um, I, I did banking for six years, two months, eight days. I couldn't have done it for 10, 15, 20 years. So I'm very curious, how have you stayed in the industry for 20 years? Well, uh, one of the ways I stay in it is I, I still ride bikes. So I think you have to have an outlet. But one of the things I love about my job is I am advising CEOs. I'm advising boards. I mean, it is super challenging. And uh, specifically within healthcare, I have literally watched whole sectors of healthcare transform new payment models, new technology. And that keeps me engaged. I mean, I'm more engaged now than I was when I started. Is that, is that because you have just learned so much about the industry? And actually, this is making me think about this book by Cal Newport called uh, So Good They Can't Ignore You. And it's similar to that Steve Martin quote on be so good they can't ignore you. But one of the fundamental parts of that book is he's discussing so many people think about doing what they're passionate about, but he says, you don't actually know what you're passionate about or the vast majority of people. And it's generally find something like a general industry that is interesting and a general job that could be interesting, but the passion develops after 
two years, five years, 10 years, 15 years when you become a craftsman? I think that's a great quote. I mean, I will tell you, one of the hottest sectors in healthcare right now is primary care. Think about primary care. The first thing that pops in your mind is your doctor. Everybody has that experience. And yet over the last 24 months, I think we've seen two dozen deals valued at literally tens of billions of dollars. And what we've been covering primary care since the mid 2000s. Uh, so I, I think that at this point, um, we are being approached and we're having the most uh, serious discussions with folks that are really looking to transform how one of the most basic parts of healthcare works. What's that interaction with your primary care doctor like? What are some non-obvious industry trends that are happening that owners of primary care practices that are, call it 25 plus locations or however the size and shape of your clients are, you know, what are some like, what are the things that they might not be seeing that they need to know about? I think that's a great question. I mean, I like the way you phrase that is what are, what are the non-obvious things, right? So there, there, I think there are actually two major trends impacting primary care. I think one is obvious, one isn't. The obvious one is payers, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, commercial payers, they're pushing providers to go at risk. They want providers to get out of this legacy fee-for-service reimbursement model to taking a monthly fee, a per patient fee, and saying you're responsible for the health status of that patient. That is having absolute ripples throughout the industry. I think the non-obvious ones uh, we're seeing are coming out of the digital health side. I mean, there is a whole cast of companies popping up, whether it's with devices, apps, uh, service models that are disintermediating the primary care physician. They're offering uh, patients more specific and more tailored options. They're, they're uh, replacing physicians' functions with devices. And I think consumers, especially younger consumers, are really smart about this and they're demanding those ways to access healthcare that really didn't exist, you know, even 15 or 20 years ago. So on that note, when you look at bringing deals to market, to what extent do you feel that the clients you have worked with and just taking a general pulse on the industry, people are prepared for that type of transformation. And the following question is, what should they be asking themselves right now as first and foremost, a business owner and growing the business and you know, secondarily selling the business or raising capital? I actually, I would flip that around, Jordan. I think the key question every provider group needs to ask themselves today is what am I going to look like? What's my practice going to look like five years from now? I can guarantee you, you haven't thought enough about the answer to that question. What are they not asking themselves? Like what are some of these things that are common in the discussions you've had on what people have been ignoring? I, I think they've been ignoring the pace of transformation. So think about all the things that are incumbent upon an individual and an independent practice to go at risk. They need incredible data analytics. They need to make real investments. Those are questions. If you're not proactively chasing those questions, uh, you're already behind in the game. Okay. So this is Q4. I'm going to have my board meeting and I'm sitting at the table and I, and I heard this episode and I'm the CEO or COO of a 25 location practice. Like what, how do I talk about this? You know, give me something specific that I could bring to my board and to my team on what I should be addressing with exactly what you're talking about. Uh, so I think the very traditional SWOT analysis, but make it one per quadrant. What is our most significant strength? What's our most significant weakness? What's the biggest threat we're facing as a practice? And what's the biggest opportunity we have? Why, why do you boil it down to one? Do you Keep think it it's focused. Because, Keep it yeah. focused. I actually think a lot of these groups, uh, it's very easy to get overwhelmed trying to think about the blocking and tackling of 
position your practice to thrive in five years, not just survive, not get absorbed, but thrive. Keep it focused. Uh, a lot of this is, is really pretty simple, but you need the accountability and the focus to, to make that happen. When you look at some of the practices or just the, the businesses within primary care services that have um, truly gone to the next level over two, three, five years, uh, what do you think are some of the common themes that have allowed them to uh, evolve? And also, what are the common themes that you have found of companies that never really grew up and never really evolved? That's a great question, Jordan. I, I think one of the things that we've seen where groups have really uh, changed their positioning within the care delivery system is they have proactively invested in both administrative and clinical parts of their practice so that they can handle more and more of a patient's needs in the four walls of the practice. So everybody talks about coding. Uh, coding is something that's fairly focused on revenue optimization or revenue management. But we've met practices where you think about, especially a senior patient who's covered by Medicare, uh, they present with back pain or they present with uh, depression. These practices have gone out and hired psychologists, social workers, chiropractors. They're addressing their primary needs and they're doing it on a fairly low cost basis um, because these are patients that if they aren't really uh, tended to early on in the practice, those are the cases that end up in the hospital or the ER and are, are truly unnecessarily expensive for that provider who may be at risk or for the system overall. Hmm. Let's, let's think of a kind of a, a practical take, another pra practical takeaway and feel free to feel free to throw this out if you disagree <laughs> with it, but, and maybe this just uh, me projecting our current strategic initiatives. Um, so one of the things that we did is we have our monday.com project tracker board and then I had to force myself, my team forced me to put out my daily activities, mm -hmm. either sales, marketing, client, how much time I spent. And after doing that, I finally could get that clarity and visibility into my activities. And I realized there are so many things that I am not focusing on or things that I am focusing on, but I shouldn't be. And maybe the call to action here for the uh, practice owners and for the client client base is, you know, really taking that time to write out the business activities that we are doing, that we aren't doing, work with the team and getting feedback. Look, I, I think you have to do that as a business owner. If you're a partner in a large group practice, could be 10 partners, could be 50 partners, you're, you're a business owner. And what, what is the, one of the key things that has happened in the physician domain is all the other entities that you're interacting with, the payers, the hospital systems, the pharmacy distributors, the retail pharmacy chains, they've all gotten huge. They've consolidated. And in the phys physician domain, that hasn't really happened. And so physicians are, have now been put on their heels. They're re reacting uh, defensively and reactively, right? How do we address challenges to our reimbursement, right? So yeah, you need to become more efficient, you know, uh, whether it's a factory analogy, Six Sigma being lean, looking at your workflows, your technology stack. Um, how can you proactively approach payers and say, hey, can we start a pilot program and go at risk? And let's, let's do this for a year and see how we do. Um, it's a shift in mindset. I mean, there's a lot to do, but some of the basic blocking and tackling, Jordan, I think you hit it, you hit the nail on the head, right? It's how am I actually spending my day? Because what's unique about the physician world is physicians are the assets and they're the revenue producers. And so the only way you can optimize that is actually investigating your own workflow. Have you found 
best practices with, you know, large, mid-sized practices, for example, where they have a certain cadence, either on a monthly basis or a weekly basis, where they block out time as business owners. And, and I'm just making a probably a gross generalization here, but I'm guessing maybe these physicians are like so focused on patients, so focused on hiring, so focused on all parts of it, as opposed to like, hey, we are taking this half day off or Friday off, like literally to focus on biz- running the business. So I, I actually think I've seen um, a little bit more of some best practices on the operational patient flow than I have at the strategic leadership level. A lot of larger groups that we talk to, uh, they have an annual retreat. Uh, I think given the pace of transformation going on today, I think annually is way too infrequent. Uh, I think this has to be a monthly leadership meeting. I think the leadership that's uh, really charged with designing and implementing the uh, strategy for that group. I think it has to be a small group, not a large group. One of the areas of friction that we see with large groups is, well, we want everybody to weigh in and be included. And the larger that group gets, the slower decisions are. Um, best practices at the practice level, yeah, care teams, uh, having a weekly meeting for two hours uh, that synthesizes everybody's views around a high risk patient or high cost patient. Um, those things exist, optimal patient panel size, optimal visit times, uh, workflow coordination so that you have a, a sort of pre-physician interaction and a post-physician interaction that doesn't use up the physician's time. Those, those things exist and we've seen them, seen them in high-performing practices and they're, they're really cool and impressive. But the reality is those practices need to be disseminated ultimately across the nation. That's interesting. And this is making me think about a framework that we've used, which is the uh, Entrepreneurial Operating System, EOS, Mm -hmm. which is uh, by Gino Wickman in his kind of famous book, Traction. And it's interesting because one of the things I found as you're describing that is we didn't do a lot of the standardization because we didn't have a, a, a like even just a basic agenda for every a template meeting and so when you're tr- constantly reinventing the wheel on, on all parts of the business it, it was difficult to focus on something simple like every week or every morning here's our 20 minute stand up and here's what we're covering and it allows us to focus once we do that on the substance of the meeting as opposed to the structure of the meeting and the substance of yeah. the business as opposed to the structure of the business I, I love that, Jordan. Uh, I'm, I'm actually embarrassed to say this. Like we, we only started doing that, you know, in the last couple of years. And I think it was really driven by COVID. Like we were all on Zoom. And so we, we have a twice a week uh, team meeting. And we finally said, look, we have to have an agenda that's literally uh, posted the night before. And it's, it's very uh, segmented. It's, it's uh, you know, engagements, it's perspective engagements, it's internal business it's events that we're hosting. And I can tell you the efficiency uh, and productivity has gone up because we're, I'm sure you deal with this. There's too many distractions. Yeah. And I also found that in a, in a zoom environment, we had to find out how do we effectively bring the team together on a daily basis because mm-hmm. some people I wouldn't see their face for like a day or two. And it's a six person team. Right. <laughs> and so we had to find a way to restructure our meetings. And so what we have kind of settled on is instead of a Monday morning, one hour huddle, and then one off throughout the week, what we've changed it to is a Monday morning, one hour, big picture for the week, big picture for the month and quarter. But then every single day at 9 a.m. for 20 minutes, we only do industry training and client training and only topics that are relevant to the entire group, not sidebars on a particular client, a particular deliverable. And then it, we can sidebar about that in meetings later. But what I found is also it just, especially in a virtual environment, it creates a structure and a startup sequence. And we lacked a startup sequence as a team Mm -hmm. to bring us together because some people are great at mornings. Some people are not, but at least it kind of brings us into a a synchronization in the absence of here's our office. 
you come in at 8 45 9 o'clock and here's our general cadence I, I think that's fantastic. I mean, I saw a post recently on LinkedIn and someone said the two questions they asked themselves before, meet, before accepting a meeting invite is, do I have something to contribute? And is, can I effectively skip the meeting and get what I need to from the meeting notes? And it's, it's just so efficient. The reality is I think we are as a team much more efficient now, virtual, working you know, for the most part, virt still virtually, uh, than we were, you know, in 2018, 2019, we actually going to close a record number of deals this year. How would you say the morale is of the team? And I ask that because one of the things I've noticed in a virtual environment is I tended to be so transactional and adding the business owner dynamic when it's, hey, I got to talk about insurance with one thing and I go, go straight to this and talk about a deal straight to this talk about an HR thing I it's a tendency to be so transactional as opposed to hey we're also a team and there's the how was your night how was your weekend tell me one good thing from the week that you had a win on yeah I look um I think the morale is is really high and I I think you know what I've tried to do with my team is remind them that they have choices, right? They can go to the office or they can work from home. They can travel to a meeting or we can schedule it virtually. Uh, but I, I recognize that on balance, this is still an incredibly stressful time for people. Yeah. And so I want people to take vacation, even if they can't travel because of COVID, just take the time. Uh, I ask people, uh, what's your workout? Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I can tell you uh, as busy as we are, I almost feel like uh, the working out or whatever it is that you do to relieve stress, that is even so much more important today. I, I, it took me a while to finally understand like working out is just part of my job. Yeah, and I mean, it makes I have to, your job. And it makes, you, it makes it more fulfilling and fun and more creative, more interesting. And I, I think that's one of the, I mean, you know, we're as a small business, but we pr prioritize like giving gym reimbursements. And oh, that's really cool. And also, you know, sharing things that people are working on. Like uh, one of our colleagues, you know, is got into Orange Theory and now she's literally going to be a personal trainer at Orange Theory on top of this. Like, that's awesome. I that want, awesome. that goes back to the idea with Google on the 20% time yeah. and integrating other parts of your life into this. I, I don't want this to be viewed as, you know, I am here from nine to five and that's it. And I don't really talk about everything else that I enjoy. We want to be integrated. Another colleague is a sommelier or he got his level one. We love that. We yeah. want people to pursue these other passions. Um, and so speaking of working out, we both have a, a common interest in triathlon. Um, and so, um, <laughs> Just kind of curious to hear, hey, how did you go from the 10 speed bike at 14 years old to probably a triathlon bike and, and, and doing, uh, you know, Ironman distance triathlons or like what's been your background in, in tries? So I, you know, it's funny cause, uh, I always think of it as every bike I got after that first one was a better bike. Um, <laughs> and part of it is the technology. Up and to the right. <laughs> yeah. The technology is so much better these days, but um, I started my career, uh, like a lot of people in banking, as an analyst. Uh, I rose up through the ranks as uh, an associate, vice president, director. Um, and, you know, candidly, my first decade in this business was all work. Um, and I, I was feeling the stress and I ended up uh, moving to Florida, which is where my team is based today. And one of the things that I sort of got exposed to was triathlons. And it was something that you could do at five in the morning, right? You can go for a run, you can go for a swim. And just as you uh, described, Jordan, I mean, to me, that is part of my job. It's a responsibility for me to take care of my mental and physical self to be a better banker and advisor. What, um, which races have you done? I've done uh, Florida Ironman a couple of times. Uh, I did the New York City uh, Olympic distance triathlon. I did the inaugural one. Um, I did a really cool half Ironman in Israel 
uh, oh, which wow. was, was my best finish, uh, fifth place in that race. Um, so, you know, one of the things I loved about uh, triathlon in general is you're literally sometimes, and I think you just went through this, you're training literally for five or six months for a one day event and the pressure you put on yourself and the focus you need to have. I mean, it's, it's very akin to what we do as bankers. I actually think there are three things that are critical as a bank, right? And they're, you know, number one is you've got to know your trade craft as a banker. There's a lot of technical things that we do, especially in mergers and acquisitions. Number two, I don't think you can really add value these days if you don't know the industry. You've got to know it cold and you've got to be really current. Uh, and then I think the third thing uh, is you've got to be able to articulate the story. I mean, the markets are crowded today. There's a lot of folks uh, competing on capital deployment, uh, family offices, venture, growth equity, private equity, late stage, public companies, SPACs. You've got to compete with your story in that crowded market. And so when we think about uh, starting any engagement, it's three disciplines. It's knowing the sector so we can then articulate the story. Then it's applying our craft as bankers to execute a process. That's interesting. It's uh, it really is. And, and it's also an Ironman distance because, <laughs> because a, a process can take six to 12 months. For sure. It is a process and it's a, uh, it's a process with transitions, right? There's that prep phase where you're getting the company ready to go to market uh, maybe that's like the swim where you're constantly picking your head up so you don't go off course. Uh, there's the marketing phase, which is that long, grueling bike part. Uh, and then the hardest part, right? You find that counterparty or that partner and you're starting the marathon. And it's so funny because I, I try to tell clients, like just when you think you're about to start coasting, you've got to start the marathon segment. <laughs> And then you hit the wall right before you're about to close. So at what point are you going around the turn buoys and you're just, it's a mosh pit around the turn buoys in the, in the, in the ocean. Swim. Uh, that, that's the pitch. Still crowded and elbowy. <laughs> is there, there has to, is there, it has to be some type of investment banking league within Ironman or triathlon. There has oh, to be. I'm sure. If yeah, there's not, we are starting this. <laughs> you start it. I actually, I've met some private equity guys that race bicycles, which I've tried my hand at, which is just as hard. I mean, it's, yeah, uh, yeah it's pretty cool. It's a, it's a whole different sport with just running, just cycling, just swimming to be a, a quality performer in your age group. And then it, it and then to bring those three disciplines all together on one day, that's going to be 10 to 17 hours. And on top of that, with the nutrition, yeah, it, it's, it's just <laughs> <laughs> got to eat, got to drink. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think that's also, you know, there is an analogy there with the nutrition and uh, an investment banking process or in running a business in that you have to have the fuel to let you do your skills. And that fuel can be something like taking the team out together. That yeah, fuel yeah. can be a, hey guys, literally tomorrow, everyone take off because we're freaking stressed and we just need some space. Or that fuel can be, we're getting the team together. And we're going to bring more people onto this pitch that would normally do it because you got to get exposure or whatever that fuel is. Um, but I think that there are just so many parallels between what we've experienced in triathlon and doing banking or us running our business. So I think that this might have to be a part one vlog of ours because mm -hmm. we could probably go on for another hour or two. We, we absolutely could. And I'll tell you, uh, I'm not trying to brag about probably my best race. But one of my races, I actually won my age group. What? And listen Wait, how to my Alva, I just now figured this. What? No, when was it? This. I was not the number. I didn't finish number one in any of the segments. So I wasn't number one coming out of the swim. I wasn't number one on the bike or the run. 
I was, you know, two or three, but when you put it all together with the transition, I ended up coming out number one in the age group. And it was just uh, this- uh, hold on, a cliffhanger. You're missing out a big detail. What was your time and what was the age group? Oh, uh, the age group was, I think, 30, 34. Um, it was a, I think it was an Olympic distance race. Uh, and I don't, I don't remember my time, but it was probably, you know, sub two hours. Okay. Awesome. And it was a, kind of really eye opening that you could come out on top if you sort of put it all together. And I really think that's apropos for what we do as bankers. I mean, uh, you can have a great prep session with your client. You can have great receptivity in the market, but if you bomb with a unfulfilled data room or you don't get them across the finish line, you might as well quit the race. Or when you hit the wall, because maybe the market is saying something that we originally thought was it, maybe the market is saying something different than what we thought that's hitting the wall. But guess what? We have to figure out a way to get around it. Yeah, that's that's a great analogy. I love the hitting the wall analogy because the ones who usually hit the wall are our clients, not not private equity clients. They they've been through this and they understand the the tempo and the dynamic. But um, you know, half of our clients are our founder and businesses. A lot a lot of them first time, most of them first time entrance into the institutional private capital markets, and they sign an LOI. And they, they want to get together and celebrate. <laughs> we're excited. It's done. Yeah. And we're there's, like, hey, a lot of, there's a lot of miles left. Sorry. We're starting the run. We're starting <laughs> the run. Yeah. Sorry. You have a marathon to go. Yes, we do. <laughs> and, and you will feel pain at miles 17 or 18. Yeah. And I guess our job as bankers in that marathon, Jordan, is we're running it with them. And we're carrying their water and we're carrying their food. Like, You're the coach slash participant. <laughs> yeah, we're the, I forget what those folks are called that are sort of pacers. You're, you're, you're a Sherpa. Yeah, we're a Sherpa, <laughs> right? All right, part two will be scheduled. This is awesome. I think we've covered a ton of ground, not just on your story that's super interesting, but also on like the nitty gritty of kind of what the, uh, the healthcare industry is going through. And I think, you know, I'd, I'd love for people as they listen to this, like to submit more questions and topics that they want covered. So thank you so much for doing this. And I can't wait for episode two. Jordan, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. 